Boston, we are very lucky to have one of the finest public science museums in the nation. And Whitehead is very proud of our longstanding partnership with the museum because they help us communicate the excitement of science in a very important way. Because more than 80% of our research funding is supported by public funds, Whitehead scientists strongly believe in communicating the results of their research to you, the, the people who fund it. And the research you're going to hear about tonight represents work at the frontiers of biomedical science. And this is just the first of what we think will be an exciting series of presentations that we hope will offer you a glimpse of what to, what's to come beyond the double helix. Without delay, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight, Dr. Richard Young. Dr. Young is a member of the Whitehead Institute and a professor of biology at MIT. He received his PhD in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale University. He's been the director of the National Cooperative Vaccine Development Group for AIDS and has served on several international committees for the World Health Organization. Dr. Young. It's always a pleasure to get an applause before you speak because you never know what's going to happen at the end of uh, anything you say. I have the pleasure of talking to you tonight about a subject that really represents a revolution for us in this particular time. In biology, the previous revolution that I was involved in was the recombinant DNA revolution, which occurred um, in the mid and late 70s and spread throughout biomedical research and really changed it entirely. It became, in fact, uh, essential to do recombinant DNA and molecular biology in order to be viewed as a, a, a contemporary professional in that profession. And now what's happened is that we have an even more profound change. It's also tool-driven, but it is more of a change in concept because what we have now is a foundation for rethinking biology. We have a foundation in genomes, and that's um, much of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, and I will have the privilege of being followed by my friend and colleague, Trey Eidecker here, who I think is one of the world's uh, new young leaders in a particular area of biology called systems biology. So I think you're going to have some fun. So we now have the genome sequences for about a hundred organisms, ranging from a variety of bacteria to small single-celled eukaryotes, cells that have a nucleus, uh, all the way up through now mice and humans. And that is causing us to rethink how we educate. Uh, now we can begin with the complete parts list uh, in describing how biology may work, and it's causing us to rethink how we investigate biological and medical problems. It's causing pharmaceutical companies to rethink their entire investments in the approaches that they take to developing new therapeutics, and it's causing people who are thinking about new generations of vaccines uh, to rethink their approaches. So I've represented five organisms up here. These are all in the class of eukaryotes. Um, the uh, smallest, simplest eukaryote that is a typical model organism for investigators is baker's yeast. It's the stuff that uh, is used to make bread and, and beer. And uh, baker's yeast has about 6,000 genes. And for the aficionados, it has about 12 million nucleotides uh, of DNA in its genome. Um, another model organism that's been used by investigators for the last couple of decades um, is the worm. I know this works, looks a little like a caterpillar, but it was the best representation I could find. Um, this particular worm is a nematode that's become a model called Sanerabditis elegans, and it has 19,000 genes. Um, the fruit fly, uh, literally that fly you see flying around fruit at home usually in the summer has 13,500 genes. Um, mice 
a favorite model organism for us has about 30,000, and you and I have about 30,000 genes. Now, I keep saying about, and that's because we do not yet have a perfect DNA sequence, and imperfections lead us to make mistakes in estimating how many genes we have. Uh, I say about because even if we had perfect sequence, we don't always recognize a gene just by looking at the sequence. Um, and in fact, uh, a very avid area of research is in determining what genes look like and therefore how many we have. Uh, something has been termed functional genomics. Well, so we have this world now founded in genome sequences and we're rethinking how we approach various problems. And I would argue that the next step beyond genome sequences is something we've already started. And that's discovering how all cellular processes, all living processes, are regulated on the scale of the genome. That is, processes that are employing all your genes all the time. Uh, and that'll become clear as we talk a little bit more about this. Now, you can imagine if we're talking about monitoring living processes on a genome-wide scale, what we're trying to do is to understand how your 30,000 or so genes are behaving at any one particular time or during a process. So let's think a little bit more about this in terms of the complexity we're dealing with. Okay, 30,000 to 40,000 genes, um, if you're curious, is a representation of DNA. Uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph that's been colorized of, I believe, a B cell, an antibody-producing cell, um, and you'll recognize mom and her child. Now, all of us have about 10 to the 13 cells. So we develop from a single cell that divides into two, and then they divide into four, and that continues occurring until it's 10 to the 13. How big is 10 to the 13? Well, if you take those genes, our genes, one of your genomes in one of your cells, and you, you stretch out that polymer, that polymer in one of your cells is about two meters long, 10 to the 13 cells. So you have a polymer in you that is two times 10 to the 13 meters, if we just put it end to end. How big is that? That's about the size of our solar system. So the DNA polymer in each of you, if I took it out here, put it on the floor, stretched it out, would span our solar system. You have about 100 different cell types. That's a number I've fudged because we don't really know how many cell types you have. You know, we look at an organ like a heart and we say, aha, heart cells. Uh, so that's a cell type. And then there's brain cells, right? Well, there are lots of different kinds of cells in the brain. So I have to give you an approximation, and that's, that's complex. Now, here's my problem. Here's a problem I think about over here in Cambridge all the time. That is, if every cell is transcribing, we'll get into what that means. 30,000 genes to some extent, um, that produces these, uh, I think of them more as working blueprints, messenger RNAs, which are, are the templates for your protein molecules. And you're about 20% protein. Your protein is the machinery that does all the work in your cells. So uh, your cells, like you, are what you eat. Um, in, in this case, the cells are what um, is being transcribed. What is the set of genes that is on or that is being transcribed describes what a cell is. I mean, just, from, just for those of you who don't remember this central dogma, DNA makes RNA makes protein, here's a cartoon. Okay? We have a DNA molecule. There are proteins called DNA binding regulators. And these proteins can recognize the specific atomic features of DNA at a, at a particular site in front of a gene. And what they do 
is they literally reach out and physically recruit something called the transcription apparatus, another protein machine, which settles down at the beginning of a gene and takes a look at the sequence of nucleotides, A, G, T, G, A, A, and makes a copy called a messenger RNA. That copy is, unlike DNA, single-stranded, and it gets transported out of the nucleus where your chromosomes are into the cytoplasm where another machine called a ribosome takes a look at that template and uses it as the um, uh, blueprint to decode it into a protein. So that's the process. DNA uh, makes RNA, makes protein. That's the way we refer to it. Well, I was saying to you that cells are defined by the genes that are on. Uh, so the set of your 30,000 or so genes that are on are the, um, uh, are the genes that are involved in what we call a gene expression program. So for example, a heart cell might have, oh, uh, 7,000 of those 30,000 genes on. Maybe those 7,000 are being transcribed into RNA which then makes protein, and all the others are off. And they have to stay off, otherwise you have a disease. So unhealthy cells have erroneous gene expression programs. Okay? Cancer cells, for example, are cells that have lost the control on their gene expression programs. They've lost the ability to stop the cell cycle. And so they continue to go around that cell cycle and proliferate and make more and more cells which creates a tumor. So after we have complete genome sequences, the next thing I think we need to know is what of all those genes are on in each cell type to do the job they do, to make a heart do what a heart does, make a brain do what a brain does. Now, we've had a technology to do this for 30 years. We had a technology that allows us to go and take these messenger RNA molecules and we can label them in a way. We can put a little tag on them um, and we can do something called hybridization where we're taking advantage of the sequence of nucleotides in the RNA to capture it and count the number of molecules that are there. That are there. Let me be a little more chemical about this. So for the aficionados, here's the duplex DNA strand. And now in this cartoon, we're going to depict the uh, various kinds of DNA uh, nucleotides, which are formed by a sugar attached to uh, four different kinds of bases. And these bases connect to one another through hydrogen bonds. And so there's a very specific order of um, pairs that can occur in the DNA. A can bind to uh, T and G can bind to C and that's the rule. A and T and G and C are pairs. And so if you have one strand of DNA, you can make a copy and, uh, and maintain the fidelity of that sequence and you do the same thing with RNA. Well, that, that rule a binds to T, G binds to C, allows us to do, uh, to detect RNA molecules by hybridization to what's called a complementary strand. The complement of AT is TA, or of GA will be CT. And if you build a technology in which you can create complementary DNA strands uh, that fit into a tiny little feature of a chip, um, as illustrated with this Affimatrix chip, um, what you can do is put very specific sequences on a single feature and build in, oh, a quarter of a million features into that chip, which means I can monitor the levels of messenger RNAs for a quarter of a million different genes, okay? More than you have. Here's an example. Here's a chip. This is that chip, okay? 
Well, $10,000, what the heck. <clears throat> they get cheaper every day. But this is a very powerful technology, and it's probably why in a market like we have today in the biotech arena, um, Affymetrics is one of the companies that is doing quite well. Well, let me tell you just briefly how you do an experiment with a, with a gene chip like this, because it's being done today for experimental purposes in clinics in Boston to help people diagnose cancers. And as you probably know, the more precise your diagnosis for cancer, the more precise um, the treatment can be and the greater the likelihood for your survival. So this is a terribly important issue for many people um, already in the clinic. What you do is you take cells, this could be tumor cells, you break them open and you isolate that RNA. It's a pretty simple process because RNA has little tags on it that you can use to isolate it. And then you go through a variety of things that molecular biologists take about half their lives to learn how to do. And then you can do this hybridization to this now broken array. Then what you do is you put it in this microfluidic machine, which sends uh, a solution through it to wash off any of the RNA molecules that are not hybridized, that are not stuck to the specifically addressed spots. And um, there, I, I skipped the step up here that the biologists take a lot of time to learn how to do, which is to attach dye molecules to these uh, RNAs so that you can send a laser down through this chip and capture a fluorescent image. And the fluorescent image tells us how many molecules we can calculate from that fluorescent, fluorescent image, how many molecules of a specific RNA are there. And through a computer, we get a nice little readout and we get the name of these genes and we get the fluorescence intensity. And with this, we can use computers to examine what's going on with those messenger RNA levels in the cells. So here it is, it's a very pretty device. Um, most laboratories involved in this kind of high throughput biology have one. So now we can go and ask, what are the genes that are on in each cell, and in healthy cells, and what happens in disease? So let's think for a moment about the limitations here. We are limited. We can't, even though our graduate students are very generous, very passionate about their work, they will still not give up portions of their liver and heart and other organs. So we have, we have a little bit of a problem, and we turn to mice or nematodes or other model organisms in order to do this. But on occasion, there are people who actually donate organs um, uh, when they die, and uh, then we have the advantage of actually looking directly at human tissue. And we can look at healthy human tissue, and we can look in disease tissue. Now, let me give you an example of how this is working today um, for a specific disease. One of the things my lab's interested in is how it is that your immune cells have evolved to deal with the broad range of pathogens that exist. And as you probably know, um, much of our genome has evolved through um, major culling epidemics, epidemics of measles, of, of plague, of tuberculosis. And so we're the survivors. Our genomes are the surviving genomes of those epidemics. Um, I've listed history of selected epidemic diseases, TB, measles, smallpox, malaria, plague, AIDS. Um, these have all been or are becoming, in the case of AIDS, very serious problems for the human population. Um, and just as an aside, I think it's interesting that in an era where we're very interested in what is going on with smallpox, not many people know that George Washington actually contracted smallpox. He contracted it in Barbados, and it, he survived it, obviously. And in uh, deciding to lead uh, the Revolutionary Army, 
he had everyone vaccinated against smallpox at a time when it was illegal in the United States to vaccinate. There was a law against it because uh, at that time it was extremely dangerous to be vaccinated because you vaccinated with the real McCoy, with the real thing, low doses of real smallpox. And um, he knew, however, that most wars are lost, uh, at least at that time, through disease. More, more soldiers die through disease than through bullets, and so he had the army vaccinated. And that was one of the few times that Congress has changed the law retrospectively to protect the president. <laughs> so let me tell you a very quick story about AIDS. And we just published this a couple of weeks ago in a magazine called Nature Medicine. Uh, so if you're an aficionado of this kind of thing, you can go find it. What we were interested in is what happens when a, uh, an AIDS virus first sees the mucosal parts of your body where you typically get infection. And at, at the genital or other mucosal surfaces, you have cells called dendritic cells. They actually have a surface on that lining. And uh, I'm representing them this thing called an APC. It's a fancy acronym for antigen presenting cell. These dendritic cells line your mucosal surfaces. And what they do is they'll pick up viruses or bacteria, chew them up, and present little pieces of their proteins to CD4 T lymphocytes, the, um, really the boss of the immune system, which then uh, does a little molecular talk to B cells that are responsible for producing antibodies. And it'll produce signaling molecules, little small proteins, that uh, also send a signal to those B cells that causes it to release lots of antibodies against the little pieces of protein that the dendritic cells were so excited about. They also present um, these proteins, the little pieces of proteins, to CD8 cells, which are called killer cells. These killer cells when they are stimulated by more signaling molecules, actually go and look for infected cells and kill them because those infected cells are the incubators of the viral infection. So now you, now you know all about immunology. Okay, that's it. That's all you need to know about immunology. Now the question is, um, in all virus infections, viruses have developed a strategy a strategy in which they initially infect some cell. Um, uh, you know, you've probably shaken somebody's hand today. They've exchanged some viruses they have by that handshake, and you'll put your hand on your mouth, and you'll inoculate yourself. You do this every day. And what's happening is you're inoculating your mucosal surface around your mouth, and these dendritic cells are picking up those viruses. And now it's a battle. Now, the viruses have the strategy of wanting to find an ultimate target cell. A hepatitis virus, for example, um, you may pick up through some blood exposure, and ultimately it's going to infect some cell that is not your, it initially infects some cell that is not your liver. But its goal is to get to your liver and infect the so-called hepatocytes there, where it causes, it can cause cancer. So all viruses have this strategy. We wanted to know for HIV what strategy it might have. So what we did was got together with a group over at Children's Hospital that was studying HIV, and we did one of these gene chip analysis on real human dendritic cells. We took real human dendritic cells out of people, we sprinkled some HIV on them, and we monitored what those cells do. And this is the kind of output that scientists get to see every day. Um, this actually represents a time course. And the colors represent what's happening to specific genes. You probably can't even read these names, and it's not important what they are. These are the names of genes. Um, this represents a time course where there are various control kinds of things being applied to cells. And here's HIV. And what was striking was that there are a couple of molecules that HIV 
and parenthetically a molecule, a regulatory molecule that's produced by HIV that regulates its genome's transcription. There are a couple of molecules we were really interested in called chemokines. We were interested in these chemokines because they are the come hither molecules. They're the molecules that dendritic cells send out when they want to recruit the immune cell. And guess what? The exact cells they're recruiting, the CD4 T cells and these cells called macrophages, are the ultimate target cells of HIV. Well, this is a virus with a very tiny genome. It's only about 10 genes. It's 10,000 base pairs compared to your 6 billion. But it has learned how to take this very frightening dendritic cell and modify its gene expression program so that it turns on only a couple of genes, and those genes encode the proteins that call the next generation target cells for HIV, and then you're permanently infected. This is a remarkable virus, quite frightening. Um, but in fact, this knowledge leads us, I'll go back a slide, this knowledge leads us to realize that this protein, TAT, it's the transcriptional regulator of the virus, we should kill that protein. And there are already pharmaceutical companies interested in developing compounds that knock out the activity of that protein. So in my lab, uh, we think that maybe if we go through the very broad spectrum of bacteria and viruses and fungal infections that represent the major uh, killers for us, that we will find that each one has a very special kind of strategy that it's evolved to, uh, to, to introduce into you to manipulate your genes. So let me go back at the end of this and tell you about, uh, go back to the complexity issue. Really the issue is can we discover how all human genes, now that we have these powerful technologies, can we discover how all our genes are regulated? And can we understand then how these become dysregulated in any disease? And I think in principle the answer is yes. We've got a whole genome sequence. We've got the technology. We're limited by access um, to tissues. But in principle, we can do that. Now, to end this, I want to tell you about a technology that I'm really excited about. In, in, the, in this complex world, it's really a trivial little detail. But I think it may change our ability to understand what these uh, regular, these gene expression programs are how they work. And it's a technique that a graduate student and a postdoc in my lab developed in which they, they take living cells and they add a little tiny chemical cross-linker that's just a glue and sticks proteins to DNA, captures proteins on DNA, so it'll capture these regulators on the DNA molecules where they were working. So now we can break open the cell and we can shear up the DNA. And what we can do is capture specific proteins with antibodies, so one, one protein at a time. And because they're still stuck to the place where they were working in the cell, what we can do is now take those DNA molecules that they're bound to, reverse the crosslinks, and figure out where that blue triangle protein was bound inside your living cell. This works incredibly well to find out where DNA binding transcriptional regulators work across your genome. Now, why is this important? Because a key thing we don't know, but is enabled by knowledge of your genome sequence and this kind of technology, is this kind of circuitry. You actually have a circuitry associated with all of those genes in your genome that makes you a 10 to the 13 cell organism and makes you do everything you do. But we don't know what that circuitry is. It's a circuitry that describes how um, a cell responds to its environment, sends signals, chemical signals, down into the nucleus that impinge on these 
uh, what are called transcriptional activators. These are the DNA binding regulators, and they're represented in this cartoon as various colored balls. And what they do is they bind to specific target genes and turn them on. It is now possible to envision building this map of your circuitry, the whole thing, for each cell, and see how it's connected from one cell to another, perhaps across your 10 to the 13 cells. And the reason I think this will be exceedingly powerful if we can accomplish it is because our pharmaceutical industry, our modern pharmaceutical industry that can do amazing things, um, depends entirely on un the understanding of pathways, on biochemical pathways. And here is an entirely new concept for such pathways. Why else might this be important? Well, here's a list, this is a short list, these funny names, AML1, P53, these are those kinds of regulators, transcriptional regulators, that um, in which mutations that are found in human families lead to cancer or developmental defects or diabetes or neurological defects, obesity, hypertension, etc. But you know what? With today, we don't know what the circuitry is over here that these are involved in. But I, I, I will assert by the end of this year, we'll know a lot about the circuitry of about half of these regulators that are implicated in disease. So I'm going to end there. Let me just say that I, I think, I hope I've persuaded you that it really is a revolutionary time where we're moving from thinking about how to solve a biological problem in a piecemeal fashion, a step at a time, understanding one gene and how it's regulated to Let's go out and understand how your 30,000 genes are regulated in all of your cells and what goes wrong in disease. I think that's a remarkable change, and that conceptually has occurred only in the last 24 or 36 months. I've got a really talented group of postdocs and grad students who work in my lab, and all of whom contributed to this. Um, we work with a laboratory of computer science at MIT run by David Gifford, and we couldn't do our work without him. The, today, you can't do high-throughput biology without interdisciplinary assistance from computer scientists, mathematicians, and engineers. Um, and I talked about some work we did on HIV with Anna Aldavini at Harvard. And these two people I want to point to, Tony Lee and Francois Robert, who are postdocs in my lab and, and have played a key role developing many of the concepts I've talked to you about. Thanks. So is the trans transcriptional activators the part of the human genome sequence that has yet to be sequenced? And is that about the hardest part left to do? Or is, and what else might be the other missing, missing part that's yet to do? So ab about 2 or 3 percent of all of our genes are actually encoding these transcriptional regulators. And so we, we now today have the sequence for most of them. The hard part is figuring out exactly where they work on the DNA. But um, technically, at least, we've solved uh, that problem in terms of now I, 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 uh, I assert we can do that, but our limitation is uh, it's going to take us a while to crank through the 100 or 200 different cell types in humans, partly because of the issues associated with accessing healthy tissue in healthy humans. But we can do this in mice first, and, um, and for those organs for which we have easy access, we can do it in humans. So the sequence isn't a limitation. 
it seems like with enough information about the pathways you described, you could create a sort of computer simulation of a whole person. Uh, you could start with cells, go to organs, go to an entire organism. At least in the context of looking at something like cancer, how far away are we right now from being able to take this kind of information and have a computer model where you could change a gene and get lung cancer out of the model? I mean, understand it at that level to the level of the organ. Um, I think we are probably about five to ten years off. Um, what I think is absolutely amazing, and I would not have made this prediction a year ago, is that in the smallest model organisms we use, Baker's yeast, um, we are probably within a year of being able to do that kind of computer modeling where we have, in essence, a virtual cell and can ask, what happens if we break that circuit and then go and uh, experimentally determine whether or not the computer was right? And that will be a huge advantage to biology because we're always looking for the part we don't understand. And we're, when we're dealing with now thousands of bits of data, uh, it challenges professors to remember lists of thousands of names. And so we actually need the computers to, to point us to the, the parts of the biology we understand least. So the parts where we make the worst prediction. I think that's about a year or two off. And uh, we're only limited in humans, again, by uh, the fact that in terms of the number of genes, uh, we only have five times uh, the number of genes that these bakers used to. That's not a big number. But we do have this problem that we have many other cell types. And so if we just focus it like you did on a particular type of cell, say a lung cell, there's really an opportunity in the next decade to do something of that sort. Um, you mentioned that some of the things you talked about are only became available or most of the research has been done in the last 24 to 36 months. Uh, what exactly happened that made that breakthrough? Um, what happened in the last three years that um, caused this vast change in thinking was that a large profession of individuals funded by taxpayers' money through the National Institutes of Health to the tune of, oh, approximately $20 billion a year augmented by the research and development dollars that ph the pharmaceutical industry puts into this, which is about $40 billion a year. That money supporting that many jobs of people really interested in biomedical problems saw that genome sequences would, be a, would provide a completely new way of thinking about the problem, would in fact force people to begin thinking about the problem across the entire parts list of organisms. And so with that large an investment and with that many people involved, uh, it also became clear that we were going to need engineers, mathematicians, computer scientists, other kinds of scientific professionals, and even ethicists. And so a portion of that money actually goes into ethics research. And so there really has been a drive uh, funded through largely taxpayers' dollars to um, recreate the foundation in which we think about biology and conduct it through these genome sequences. may be fairly uh, simplistic, but given the information that we now have, does the concept of there being, in quotes, junk DNA on our chromosome strands become a little less um, realistic? Are we seeing that that junk actually acts as a either a, a repetition of the, of the genome landing site for those activators? Well, I, I feel like um, when scientists refer to DNA as junk DNA, 
it's um, it's sort of in the eye of the beholder. You know what? Uh, my wife and I disagree on what is junk, uh, and uh, I think scientists would disagree as well on what is junk. And what we're finding is, um, again, only in the last three or four years, we've come to realize there's a whole new class of very important regulatory RNA sequences called microRNAs. And they are so, they're unbelievably important in regulating our genomes. We didn't have a clue until a few years ago. So all of a sudden, that part's not junk. So what about the other parts that are still considered junk? I, I, we'll see. We'll see. The jury's not in on junk. <laughs>